Hi, I'm your host Ajay Behel, Corporate Vice President and Head of Mega Verticals in HCL America. And this is a platform where I bring to you perspectives from the industry leaders who are shaping the very future of these industries. Today we have with us Gary Cantrell. Gary has more than 30 years senior executive experience across information technology, manufacturing and financial services, including 10 years with companies like Honeywell, Bank of America, Textron, JBill. He's a dynamic cross-functional executive who's held leadership roles in program management, finance and supply chain, including close to two decades in the role of a CIO. He's led the information technology and business process transformations on a global scale and is a strong supporter of diverse talent development. Hi, Gary. Welcome to this platform. Thank you. Uh, Gary, you have been in the manufacturing industry for a very, very long time. Uh, clearly, there are a lot of opportunities for growth in the manufacturing industry today, given the context of what we are seeing in the marketplace. Uh, sure. Would you like to give us with some examples how this might work uh, differently in the manufacturing industry, given the technologies that, is, uh, that are available today? Yeah, um, you know, I think through this, and I, I think probably the single biggest opportunity is around connecting the ecosystems within, especially large companies. Um, we've got lots of legacy enterprise data. There's lots of data that's coming off of the manufacturing lines. And in those instances where those have been integrated, we've seen some good results, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I think from the from just a pure opportunity standpoint in the manufacturing industry, syncing those two systems up, getting that data integrated or harmonized to some degree, and being able to then take that data and use it to further digitize processes and automate those, I think it's just a huge opportunity. You're starting to see a lot of that. I think you've seen some of that with, even before the pandemic, you saw some of this with um, optical inspection, where we started taking data um, off the line and using that to replace the human operator that was uh, going through and, and checking anomalies, if you will. And we found out that we actually achieved a very high level of accuracy. And I think that's progressed further during the pandemic activity. That I think it's going to continue to grow. And I think once you get access to that data, you open up the door for analytics, you open up the door for additional machine learning and eventually AI, which again, bits and pieces are there, but uh, it opens the door to all the new tools that are coming out. And I think that's going to make a fundamental change over the next few years. But where is the challenge for the CIO or the CDO at this point of time? So when you really look at this workplace and you've been, you've been in those shoes, Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not as easy as just... I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, it, it, it's not nearly as easy as it sounds. It sounds great. Hey, we just integrate the data. Well, you know, if it was that easy, we would have probably tackled that a few years ago. Um, but I think it starts to get, it, it gets to be really complex and the data uh, harmonization, if you will, is the big challenge. And it's not, so, it's not a, as you know, it's not a quick resolution. It's, it's not a silver bullet to be able to go make that happen. It's just a lot of heavy lifting and you have to constantly chip away at it. And I think that gets back to where you set your priorities and then you know, focus on it a piece at a time because, the, you know, you've just got a massive amount of industry structure, technology variation, platform variation that you have to work your way through. And especially, I think, in some of the companies that you've worked, those are really, you know, conglomerates which have had, I'm presuming, different types of technologies, more technologies than you care to remember at this point of time. Y yeah, absolutely. And and the other piece, there's more technologies than, than meets the eye. When you start peeling back, you find a lot more. But the other piece, there's a huge amount of capital expenditure that these companies have put in over the year, and that's not just where I've been. It's you know other folks that we've dealt with and, and our supply base. And those technologies are still working just fine. They're just not working in the context that we need them to work in order to take the next step in the Industry 4.0 context. So, yeah, it's, I mean, huge lifting. Uh, a lot of innovation has to take place in order to make that happen. So I think that's one of the pacing items is how fast can we uh, innovate with some of the new models that harmonize the data, and we're seeing more and more of that. I think that's going to be the accelerant that's going to allow us to get that done. 
So uh, I'm going to, you know, extend the thought that you just had around the pandemic. Uh, there's really been a big difference pre and post pandemic in practically every company, the way they've actually approached the market. I'm pretty sure uh, that has, that is absolutely true for manufacturing companies as well. Uh, now, how does the pre and post pandemic differ when you look at my, uh, micro and macro economic parameters for a manufacturing company? Yeah, so um, there's two. Let me talk about a couple of macros and then a couple of micros. So starting with the macros, I think, um, and and we certainly had this when I was at, at Jabel. Um, we certainly got surprised by the level of virtualization we could do, and the level of uh, virtual collaboration we could do in our processes. Uh, and and I'll take that a step further based on personal experience. That's not just in the manufacturing industry. I think the manufacturing industry is probably accelerated by five years on what they've been able to do using virtualization, but I'm seeing it all over the place and in all kinds of personal industries like moving is another example. Um, and and I, virtualization, you're really talking about being able to do things virtually. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It, so, so it gets down to it, it's the hybrid work environment. Right. Um, I'll probably catch a lot of flack for this as being a believer because I... I was one of the skeptics and pulled back. I was hesitant on this, but I've been amazed at how much virtual work, virtual collaboration, and I'll go to the next step, virtual change that the teams have been able to uh, pull off and get the job done in very effectively and very efficiently, which I think is, is extended way beyond anything that anyone I had talked to pre-pandemic. So I think, and I think going post-pandemic, that's going to continue. That's that's going to continue to accelerate. It's not going to slow down. Um, the other thing I think we learned on as a result of the pandemic, and there was a lot of effort going on on the supply chain side um, pre-pandemic. And it was really around supply chain transparency, trying to leverage some of the analytics and partnership uh, business transparency stuff. But I think what's happening as, as a function of the pandemic was there's been a fundamental shift in what we're doing with supply chains. And pre-pandemic, it was all around globalization and efficiency. And I think the teams did a fantastic job. They made tremendous progress. I'm going to talk to you a little more on that, right? So with a clearly a macroeconomic trend, clearly the, the the focus is on trying to look at efficiency very differently from a supply chain perspective rather than just focusing on efficiency. It's about, you know, the risk that the geopolitical risk that is actually coming to the right. picture because of it. Uh, do you see manufacturing companies really, you know, changing their supply chains completely to de-risk themselves for the political change that is that is uh, that can be the driver at this point of time? Yeah, um, I think they will try to reduce the level of risk. I don't think they can eliminate the level of risk or eliminate the, you know, re eliminate the risk. I think there's always going to be an element of risk. Um, I think the, as a practical matter, you can't onshore, all the companies can not onshore, mm -hmm. all the production. So I think that's, that's why I stress, I think there's going to be a more balanced approach. I think there's going to be a lot more attention to the critical components that have very limited supply chains. And I think that's where, because a lot of the a lot of the components you can you have multiple sources, those kinds of things. There's a few that will get a lot of attention, um, and a good examples chips. I mean, right now, you know, it's affecting everything. Um, there was ample. We thought there was ample supply, but it's not just a supply issue. It's 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 a type issue. It's not just chips. It's the right type right. of chips that we got to have. So I think you're going to see a lot more focus on that, and that applies. To virtually all manufacturers, it just you know depending on what they're what they're producing, um, and I think customers of uh, the manufacturers, so those customers that do uh, contract manufacturing, as an example, I think they're going to be much more astute to it, and you're going to see a lot more dialogue around. Um, they're going to be putting a lot more pressure on the manufacturers to go, okay, how are you protecting my supply chain? Yes. And they'll take a, a bigger hand in that if history proves correct. Changing gears a little bit. Industry 4.0, right? It is, you know, you've seen it go from a hype to being much more pragmatic about what it can do and what it means for uh, organizations and people. What in your mind is next for Industry 4.0? Yeah, I, I think um, 
we've seen a lot of point solutions come out of Industry 4.0. Right. Uh, and I think folks have done a fantastic job with that. And I think that, like any big project, if you can get some small wins, it helps, uh, it helps a lot, right? Yes. It helps build confidence and it also uh, kind of helps folks see the vision. Um, I think what I think we're at the stage now where, and, and especially after the pandemic, so not to keep going back to that, but just the lessons learned that we had from the pandemic experience where we just figured out how to do things. I think that's going to really accelerate what we're doing with Industry 4.0 um, in the bigger context. Um, I, I think that the companies that are going to be really successful, and I know in a past life, last couple of lives, we've spent a lot of time focusing on the roadmap. What are we trying to accomplish? What outcomes, what business outcomes do we want to achieve? Um, the technology side is complicated enough, and there's a lot of back-end stuff that we talked about earlier we have to go tackle, and that's going to be messy in its own right. But that in and of itself doesn't necessarily provide business value, which is part of the challenge. But I think if we can get alignment between um, the business and the enterprise providers, IT and is, is a great example on, okay, where are we trying to get to? What business value are we trying to get out of this? Are we trying to increase cycle time? We're trying to virtualize, which I, I know everybody's going to have that front mm -hmm. and center. So I think that's going to be the part that um, they got to get aligned on and get the roadmap. Then I think um, once you kind of get there, you got to start breaking that down into some tactical projects like I was talking about. So you go on the line. I look at some of the activities that have been done with pulling data off of some of the older uh, manufacturing devices and working with the operational teams um, and then in, trying to integrate that with the enterprise systems. We've had some good wins there. And we had some fairly quick wins there, but they were point wins. Now to do that in a broader context, I think, is is really what's going to take us to the next step. But do you see that ev evolution happening for all the manufacturing companies? Is, is this really going to be an option or something just necessary for survival? And how quickly will the shift, entire shift happen? I don't think it's going to be an option. I think it's it, you're going to have to do this to survive. I don't think it's going to be a two-year survival trend, but I think you start looking five to seven to ten years out. I think the companies that embrace Industry 4.0, they embrace, you know, digitizing the processes, virtualizing, automating. Those are the companies that are going to come out ahead. I think that the other part of this is is that the companies who don't try to do it on their own and realize that they need partners to help do that are going to be the ones that are going to get there first. They're going to get there the most efficiently or the most productively, and they're going to be the, the big winners. And I think you mentioned partners. So what role do partners really play for, for a company in this journey? Yeah, and great question, because I'll look at this the way I did the last couple of CIO jobs I had. Um, when I look for a partner, I look for someone who's going to have skin in the game. And I don't care whether I'm looking at an integration partner, systems integration partner, software partner, manufacturing hardware partner. It doesn't really matter. I think anyone who's coming in and doing something with me that's strategic, I want them to have some skin in the game. I want them to bring an expertise to the table. Um, I want them to bring some experience that is valuable that they can use to help me drive where I'm going, help drive my roadmap. Um, help me unlock the business value piece of it. And, you know, given their exposure to multiple customers, multiple industries, they should bring a wealth of knowledge there. They also ought to bring some resources. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, they have good resources that can focus on the problem they're helping me solve. I can free up my resources to go work on other projects. And that's, that's what I expect to see out of a partner. And that's where I think partners bring a tremendous amount of value. Uh, you just can't do it all yourself, and uh, and, and you don't want to try to outsource the whole thing and have partners do it all because they just don't understand your business. Um, but I think if you get the right partner in there, you build a good collaborative relationship that has an element of openness and transparency, it can be hugely valuable and help you move a lot faster. I know you mentioned that you know you would value uh, partners bringing in experience from other industries. Yes. Um, you know, manufacturing in a lot of ways is a very different industry. How, which areas of manufacturing? And, you know, we debate this often, right? If you, uh, there are various value chains that make part of manufacturing. Which areas can benefit most from other industries? And, 
uh, where there would be value to, to really make sure that, you know, you're getting the expertise from other industries into manufacturing? Yeah. Um, so I, I use, a, and, and manufacturing is a big footprint. I use an example from long ago. Um, a while back, we were working on aerospace airplanes and stuff like that. And we started talking about Lean Six Sigma and we questioned how we were doing some of the designs. And at the time, we had been bringing in some folks from other industries, namely the automotive industry. And we said, well, gosh, if, I mean, an impeller is an impeller. If we can use this process in automotive, why can't we use this process in aerospace? And that was a little bit of heresy. But at the end of the day, after a lot of, you know, food fights and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> we found out there was a lot of stuff that we could that we could do differently that was more efficient, that did not impact performance, did not impact quality. And that was a function of that cross-fertilization, if right. you will. And I think um, if I look ahead and we start looking at going more digital mm -hmm. and we get into the virtualization and autom uh, automation side of things, I think there's a there's a lot more that we can learn from um, some of the um, uh, some of the companies that are asset like, yeah, um, just the way they do it, and that that I think that's going to add huge benefit as well. And it, it's not it doesn't all fit, not one size fits all. It doesn't 100 percent translate. But if you get those nuggets out of there that are beneficial, then I think that's hugely valuable.